In the field of gravitational wave detection, scientists have been tirelessly striving to push the boundaries of what we thought was possible. They work with intricate machines, detectors like LIGO and Virgo, that sit on Earth's surface and bear witness to cosmic events far beyond our reach. This incredible technology, known as interferometry, was first explored in the 19th century by Michelson and Morley, who sought to detect the elusive ether. Today, it's used to detect gravitational waves that subtly dance through the fabric of spacetime. Can you imagine? The light split into two components, send off in different directions, bouncing off mirrors and recombining to create an interference pattern that speaks of phenomenon happening millions of light years away. But, like any great story, there's a twist. Even with these scientific marvels, we were still limited by the very laws of physics. Until now, that is. The veil has been lifted just a bit more, and what lies beyond, ah, you'll hear about that shortly. What's up, my wonderful and curious folks? Excited to uncover the unknown together? I'm your host, Caesar, and beside me is our insightful commentator, Sonia. We're here to take you on a journey into the heart of curiosities on the Curiosity Wonderland. Hi everyone. Can't wait to delve into today's topic. And while you're here, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that bell icon to stay updated with our daily explorations. Let's dive in, shall we? Let's take a closer look at LIGO, or the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. This pioneering institution has managed to squeeze quantum states, surpassing even the famed Heisenberg's limits. In our quest to detect gravitational waves, there have always been challenges that seemed impossible to overcome. Since the year of 2015, we've had some powerful tools at our disposal. Advanced LIGO detectors, followed by the Virgo detector, enabled humanity to directly detect gravitational waves from specific sources. This includes merging stellar mass black holes, merging neutron stars, and possibly even merging black hole neutron star pairs. Exciting, isn't it? More recently, scientists have applied a different technique, which involves leveraging pulsar timing. This approach has uncovered a cosmic hum, which is essentially the sum of all background gravitational wave signals with a much longer timing period. Yes, the universe hums in its own unique way. But our progress hasn't been without its limitations. We're frequency limited, meaning we can only detect sources from systems that emit gravitational waves within a specific, narrow range of orbital periods. We're also limited by the seismic noise floor of Earth, as even the subtle vibrations caused by plate tectonics can prevent our terrestrial detectors from seeing signals below a certain amplitude. And, as you'd expect, we're limited by the very laws of physics themselves. These laws prevent us from knowing all properties of any signal simultaneously, even within our own detectors. Much of the focus on gravitational wave detection has been on getting as close as possible to the theoretical noise floor of our detectors. But, friends, an incredible breakthrough has just taken place. We've managed to surpass the standard quantum limit for signals in our detectors. Want to know how we did it? Well, brace yourselves. The science behind it is mind-blowing. Let's delve into the fascinating mechanism of an interferometer, the technical heart of our gravitational wave detectors. Here's what we typically do with an interferometer. Start with a source of light and split it into two perpendicular components. One component goes a specific distance in one direction while the other travels the same distance in a perpendicular direction. These components get reflected off mirrors at the far end and are brought back together to be observed in our detector. This technique was first used in the 1980s by A. E. Michelson and E. W. Morley. They hoped to detect the elusive ether. Their assumption was that a sensitive enough interferometer could reveal Earth's motion relative to the medium light travels through. If you split light into two perpendicular components and bring them back together, they produce an interference pattern. If there's a medium that light travels through, this pattern should depend on the orientation of your apparatus relative to its motion. So, if I understand correctly, they expected to see a different pattern of light based on Earth's movement through the supposed ether? Exactly. But their experiment didn't yield the results they were hoping for. They didn't find any such ether and there's a good reason for that. The speed of light is the same for all observers in all reference frames, and there is no slowing of light in the direction of Earth's motion. This was clarified only in 1905 when Einstein proposed his special theory of relativity. Despite the initial disappointment, the Michelson-Morley experiment was a significant milestone. It even led to Michelson being awarded the 1907 Nobel Prize in Physics. 
Now, over a century later, this interferometry technique is a vital tool for detecting gravitational waves. Fascinating. How does that work? You see, if space remained constant, an interferometer wouldn't detect any changes. But gravitational waves cause space to contract and expand in perpendicular directions. If the length of the two perpendicular arms of the interferometer setup changes relative to each other, we can detect a signal. This is precisely what's predicted to happen when a gravitational wave passes through one of these detectors. To help you visualize this, imagine you're holding a large, square sheet of rubber. If you tug at opposite corners of the sheet, it stretches diagonally but contracts along the other diagonal. That's similar to how space contracts and expands with a gravitational wave. This, in essence, is the kind of change our detectors are looking for. So, when a gravitational wave passes through a location in space, it causes an alternating expansion and compression in different directions. These fluctuations cause changes in the lengths of the laser arms in our gravitational wave detectors like LIGO and Virgo. So, those changes in lengths effectively act like a signal for gravitational waves passing through? Absolutely. The cosmic mergers that create gravitational waves produce these alternating contraction and expansion effects. By reflecting the laser light within the cavity a few thousand times before recombining the beams and reconstructing the signal, a periodic shift in the observed interference pattern should reveal the presence of gravitational waves. Fascinating. And this method has been used successfully over 100 times to detect gravitational waves, right? Yes, it's quite a milestone. But remember, LIGO and Virgo mainly see mergers of stellar mass black holes and neutron stars. These objects have brief periods relative to more massive ones which also generate gravitational wave signals. Nevertheless, the success of these detectors has paved the way for future ones that will be sensitive to longer periods. I see. But how do we understand what is known as the quantum limit? Great question. In any quantum measurement, it's impossible to measure what are known as complementary quantities with arbitrary precision at the same time. This is known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Oh, I've heard of that. It's like trying to measure the position and momentum of an object at the same time, right? Exactly. The more precisely you measure the position of an object, the more uncertain the momentum of that object becomes, and vice versa. The quantum nature of reality ensures this. This uncertainty principle extends beyond just position and momentum. Let's take the example of an unstable particle. The more precisely you measure its lifetime, the more uncertain its energy becomes, including even its rest mass energy, and vice versa. So, this uncertainty principle applies to pairs of complementary quantities? Exactly, and there are many pairs like this. For instance, if you measure a particle's inherent spin in one direction, its inherent spin in the two other mutually perpendicular directions becomes more uncertain, and vice versa. The same goes for voltage and free electric charge, electric field and electric polarization density, and so on. The position-momentum uncertainty relation is certainly the most famous one, but it's just one example of many. I can see how this would add to the complexity of measuring something like a gravitational wave. You've hit the nail on the head. This uncertainty concept becomes very important for detectors like LIGO, especially in relation to the photons that travel back and forth across their interferometer arms. Consider the uncertainty relation between the amplitude and phase of a light signal. Think of it like conducting a video call with limited total bandwidth. You have to choose between having middling quality audio and video, having high quality audio with worse video, or good quality video with disrupted audio. So, there's a similar trade-off between the amplitude and phase of a light signal? Precisely. There's a total amount of inherent uncertainty that can't be removed from both of these signal components, combined, regardless of what tricks you use. But, with the technique of squeezed quantum states, you can adjust the amount of uncertainty in each of amplitude and phase accuracy to extract the maximal possible signal from your data in your endeavor to detect gravitational waves. Now here's where it gets even more interesting. With the technique of quantum squeezing, the accuracy of one can be increased at the cost of the other. How does that work? Instead of letting nature make the default choice, the researchers at LIGO have started to optimize this trade-off to maximize the information they can extract from a gravitational wave signal. They use what's known as frequency-dependent quantum squeezing. Sounds technical, but what does it mean? It's where a greater amplitude uncertainty is chosen at later times in the merger and a greater phase uncertainty is chosen at earlier times. 
This improves upon the default sensitivity that was previously achieved when nature made the decision. This remarkable technique has improved LIGO's detection sensitivity by up to 65%, making it possible to detect mergers at greater distances and see fainter amplitude signals. So, they've essentially leveled up their ability to detect these waves? Exactly. This technique also helps in better characterizing the source, helping scientists pinpoint properties like mass and distance for any mergers observed. What are some of the key challenges they face with this approach? Good point. The mirrors reflecting LIGO's laser light can be a source of quantum noise, a kind of background disturbance. This is true even at cryogenic temperatures and with the most pristine vacuum inside the laser arms ever created on Earth. So, at high frequencies, knowing the amplitude of the signal becomes less important. Instead, it's the knowledge of the phases that plays a key role. This balance of phase and amplitude is a fascinating dance. At high frequencies, they squeeze the phases, which ultimately causes the mirrors to vibrate, creating what they call a rumble within LIGO's mirrors. A rumble? That reminds me of the time I was at a concert, and the bass was so intense it made the entire building vibrate. Exactly. Now, at lower frequencies, the light can be squeezed differently. There they optimize the amplitude of the wave, reducing this rumble, at the expense of a less precise phase. This is acceptable because the low-frequency phase characterization of these sources is less important than the high-frequencies phase signals. So squeezing in different ways, for different frequencies, hmm, that reminds me of when I tried to pack for my last vacation. I had to choose what items were more important to squeeze into my suitcase. That's a perfect analogy. And this technique gives LIGO a massive advantage. It helps identify the signal earlier than ever, which means more data to work with. And here's an exciting development, LIGO has managed to achieve frequency-dependent squeezing. Now they enjoy the best of both worlds, greater phase sensitivity at high frequencies and greater amplitude phase sensitivity at low frequencies. Amazing. It's like they figured out how to pack both the essential and the non-essential items in their suitcase. That's a great way to put it. As Professor Rana Adhikari of Caltech said, before, we had to choose where we wanted LIGO to be more precise. Now we can eat our cake and have it too. Even though LIGO's dual laser arms are each 4 kilometers long, tiny quantum effects are pivotal for its capabilities. You see, LIGO began squeezing light for its third data run in the years of 2019 and 2020. And then they had to shut down for upgrades, right? Yes, that's correct. But they started back up for their fourth run in May of 2023, with new frequency-dependent cavities for squeezing light. And these improvements are not limited to LIGO alone. Oh, you mean the Virgo detector? Exactly. The upgraded Virgo detector, which also uses squeezed light, will join the observation run in a few months. And let's not forget the Kagra Gravitational Wave Observatory, which adds a fourth detector to the mix and will soon leverage frequency-dependent quantum squeezing as well. So, in the realm of gravitational waves, our detectors are so precise that even the smallest improvement can be a powerful enhancement when it comes to exploring the faint and distant universe. So it's like we're turning up the resolution on our cosmic TV? Yes, exactly. As MIT's Lisa Barsati said, we can't control nature, but we can control our detectors. The quantum nature of the light creates the problem, but quantum physics also gives us the solution. So, we're essentially looking at a clearer window into the gravitational wave universe than ever before. So in short, gravitational wave detectors like LIGO and Virgo have undergone a quantum leap. Despite the noise and the limits put by quantum physics, they've managed to break through by using frequency-dependent quantum squeezing. Now they can detect distant cosmic events with higher precision than ever before. After all, in the realm of gravitational waves detection, it seems like it's not about how much noise you make, but how you make it. That's a perfect summary. And to our listeners out there, if you've enjoyed this quantum journey as much as we did, make sure to squeeze that like button. Drop us a comment and share this episode with your friends, family, and all your fellow quantum enthusiasts. We're so grateful for your company on this cosmic journey, and we can't wait to have you back for our next episode. Until then, keep your eyes on the skies and your mind open to the marvels of the universe. Couldn't have said it better. Thank you all for tuning in to Curiosity Wonderland, and remember, there's always something new to discover. Goodbye for now, and take care.
Today's fascinating exploration of quantum states and gravitational waves was inspired by an article titled LIGO Successfully Squeezes Quantum States, Surpassing Heisenberg's Limits, written by Ethan Siegel on Big Think, published on October 25, 2023. If you're keen on diving deeper into the subject, you can find the full URL in the video description. Alright, until our next cosmic journey, I'm off.